All right. Well, yeah. Thank you, everyone, for joining uh, PCEC for our community conversation today. My name is Jonathan Hedinger, and I'm the communication director for Park County Environmental Council. We're thrilled to be talking about bison today and the Yellowstone Bison Draft Environmental Impact Statement. Um, we are joined by uh, Shana Drimmel from the Greater Yellowstone Coalition and Shami Anderson from uh, Defenders of Wildlife. And we're just excited to hear from these experts about what's been going on with Yellowstone Bison and um, how we can help the park better manage bison into the future. Um, this is a part of our community conversation series um, where we discuss conservation issues in Park County, everything from city growth policy to the housing action plan to issues like wolves and bison. And we're really glad to have everybody today. Um, I'm going to do a quick introduction about PCC and then let this our speakers uh, take it away. So PCEC is uh, your local conservation group with 650 contributing members and 3,000 supporters across Park County. We work to safeguard the land, water, wildlife, and people in Yellowstone's Northern Gateway through grassroots organizing and advocacy. And we are really excited to be doing more on Yellowstone Bison. This is a really critical time with um, the park updating its EIS. And it's a time that like, we can all really make a difference in um, the conservation of the species. So um, yeah, Shana, do you just wanna take it away? Thank you. Can you all hear me okay, I hope? Awesome. So again, I'm Shana Dremel. I work for the Greater Yellowstone Coalition. So I'm gonna start us off today with a little bit of background and history on this issue and sort of how we got to where we are today. Um, and then I'm gonna hand it over to Shami Anderson with the Defenders of Wildlife. And she's gonna talk about kind of the broader scale national level work that's going on around bison and how that ties into this issue. Um, and before we take questions at the end, I believe Jason Baldez is gonna be joining us today as well. Um, and we'll hand it over to him to talk about sort of the tribal perspective and all of the fantastic work that he is involved in right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and jump in for the sake of time here. So only 200 years ago, there was an estimated 30 to 60 million bison that roamed the grasslands of North America from what is known as present day Canada to Northern Mexico. Um, they were an important ecological keystone species uh, for grassland ecosystems and that their behaviors um, and movements literally shaped the physical environment. Um, they were an inherent part of the cultural heritage and lifeblood of many Native American tribes. Mm -hmm. However, by 1902, only 23 wild bison remained after the federal government began a campaign in the late 1800s to systematically wipe out these millions of bison, really in an act of war against Native American tribes who so depended on them. And these 23 remaining wild bison had found refuge in the interior of Yellowstone National Park. So fast forward today, um, there are somewhere around 450,000 bison across North America. However, most of these animals are privately owned, they're confined, fenced, uh, they're no longer genetically pure, meaning they've been bred with cattle somewhere along the way, um, and they're considered domestic livestock in many cases. Uh, furthermore, um, most of the remaining bison only occupy a, a small fraction of their former range, less than 1%, in fact, by some estimates and most tribal and ancestral lands remain void of bison. Um, of the 19 public conservation herds that are currently managed by the Department of Interior, most of these animals are segregated into small isolated herds with just a few hundred animals, uh, leaving them prone to inbreeding and other genetic issues and threatening further loss of genetic diversity. Um, the one exception, however, is Yellowstone's iconic bison herd. Um, after a hundred years or so of conservation efforts today, there are around 5,000 bison in Yellowstone National Park, which not only makes them the largest population of free roaming plains bison, they are also considered by many to be the last remaining truly wild herd that is ecologically viable, genetically valuable, uh, large and wide ranging. Um, they descended from the last wild herd and Yellowstone is the only place in the US where bison have continuously lived since prehistoric times. 
Um, these bison are a reservoir of some of the most valuable genetics for the long-term conservation of the species. Uh, they are still exposed to a whole host of natural selection factors. And given their large numbers, they have retained much of their genetic diversity and many of the sort of adaptations that have been lost in other more domesticated or smaller herds throughout the country. Um, and then finally, this herd really has unparalleled significance to many Native American tribes who see Yellowstone bison as uniquely linked to their ancestral descendants. Um, and this map here shows the 49 tribes that do have direct cultural and ancestral ties to Yellowstone bison and the lands and resources of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Um, despite this, however, uh, the conservation success story of Yellowstone bison has been fraught with controversy. Um, and still today, Yellowstone National Park uh, is really forced to manage these bison under an outdated 23-year-old plan referred to as the Interagency Bison Management Plan. And that plan is really meant to significantly limit bison numbers, as well as their distribution outside the park through slaughter and hazing. Um, and this was and still is largely due to unsubstantiated fears around brucellosis transmission, transmission risk and really to protect the Montana livestock industry. Um, even though there has never been a documented case of a wild bison transmitting brucellosis to livestock in the wild and on the landscape, and in fact, all transmission events that have taken place have been linked back to Greater Yellowstone uh, elk. Um, so we collectively believe that our most ecologically and culturally significant wild bison herd deserves a lot better. Um, so we currently have an opportunity right now to do something about this, and that is the subject of our conversation today. Um, Yellowstone has initiated the process to write a new Yellowstone bison management plan, um, and for which a draft EIS is currently open for public comment. Um, we see this really as an important opportunity to chart a new course for Yellowstone bison um, and to update and shift how they are managed that really ref reflects um, a lot of new information, uh, changed circumstances and regulations, and really significant progress that has been made since that original IBMP was finalized back in 2000. Um, ultimately, we see this as an, a timely and really much needed opportunity to shift away from the ship to slaughter model of population management and range constriction to one focused on tribal partnership and cooperation and the conservation and restoration of this iconic wild bison herd. Um, and this namely through the rehoming of Yellowstone bison to tribal and ancestral lands and then restoring these bison to the larger landscape um, outside of Yellowstone. The current comment period uh, we just heard has been extended to October 10th, um, and they hope to have the final uh, EIS and record of decision out by next summer. Um, so as I mentioned, um, we've made significant progress since that original IBMP was implemented back in 2000 that really warrants some changes to how these bison are managed. Um, many of our conservation orgs have been working over the last couple of decades to increase tolerance for wild bison on the landscape outside the park. Um, we've done this through uh, removing potential cattle conflicts on the landscape north and west of Yellowstone, where bison want to migrate in the winter months, um, through voluntary grazing allotment buyouts, as well as land leases. Um, GYC and Defenders of Wildlife and our partners with NRDC, as well as Sierra Club started what's called the Yellowstone Bison Coexistence Program back in 2011. And that's a program that helps landowners living in these areas north and west of Yellowstone to build uh, bison exclusion fences on their private property to keep bison out of conflicts and um, to keep them from damaging private property. Um, and, you know, all of this work really helped to sort of prime the landscape for the return of wild bison. And, and through this work, we were able to advocate for the designation and establishment of what are called bison tolerance areas uh, north of the park and west of the park. And those areas are shown here on this map um, in those polygon colors. And uh, Oyana also mentioned, too, that the red areas on the map are retired grazing allot allotments, as well as some land leases that we work to um, help retire and to remove cattle from that landscape so that we could get these tolerance areas designated. Uh, as well, um, treaty hunting has been initiated since 2006 that, that began. Um, 
We have updated science on disease transmission risk, and we know now that elk are much more likely to transmit brucellosis than bison are on the landscape. Um, there were changes in the brucellosis uh, regulations with the establishment of what's called the designated surveillance area um, program. And basically what that does is essentially what's that what that has done is, is um, if a producer um, somewhere in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem does end up having um, a, a, a cow or some livestock show up as being brucellosis positive, then that state will no longer lose its class free status. And so it's it's really benefited the whole livestock industry. Um, there was the development and then recent expansion of the bison conservation transfer program, which Shami is going to talk about here in a moment. Um, and through that program, there's just really a strong desire to use Yellowstone bison to support the ecological and restoration of the species, both on um, ancestral public lands, but on tribal lands across the continent. Um, and then we have new science out of Yellowstone uh, showing that the park can actually hand, handle somewhere between eight to 10,000 bison um, during the summer months. So before I get into talking about the specific alternatives that the park is um, out there for public comment and, and kind of our recommendations, I'm gonna hand this over to Shami to talk about the continental strategy for restoration of bison and then the conservation transfer program. Hi everyone, Shami Anderson, Senior Field Representative for Defenders of Wildlife's Rockies and Plains program based here in Livingston. And um, yes, this Yellowstone Environmental Impact Statement and the, and the long range plan is of major consequence to not only the herd here in the park that's of ecological, cultural and tourism value and benefit, but also for restoring bison across the plains. As Shana noted, we had upwards of 30 to 60 million bison. We're never gonna have that giant population again roaming the plains, but if we can develop supplement or conservation or cultural herds of genetic importance, such as with Yellowstone bison, then we can create what is considered by biologists a meta population of bison, plains bison, returning to the plains from Canada all the way to Mexico. Such as the initiative under the American Bison Society that actually began with a number of stakeholders. Um, it included um, stakeholders that manage bison um, for agricultural purposes, which Shana mentioned about 450,000 animals out there are for that purpose. And many of them have some cattle introgression. But what the strategy is mostly focused on or has a huge emphasis on is the bison that are managed as wildlife, which is about 40 to 50,000. Um, more than half of those are in tribal cultural herds. Um, so the strategy is to bring all the stakeholders together, you know, uh, tribes with buffalo and, and those who wish to restore buffalo back to their lands. Um, also working with um, federal land partners like Yellowstone National Park, Theodore, Wind Cave and Badlands National Parks, and even with um, nonprofits such as the Southern Plains Land Trust in Colorado and American Prairie Reserve. Um, that have smaller herds also contributing of, um, to uh, meta population across the plains, ecological restoration of the species. So the strategy fits well within the Department of Interior's Bison Conservation Initiative, which actually started many years ago, but it was authorized by the Trump administration. So it has bipartisan support. And now under Secretary Deb Holland, uh, she uh, passed an order that would allow for $25 million that would support the bison conservation initiative and with an emphasis on tribes being able to bring back buffalo to their lands and providing in, in, uh, economic opportunities for them to manage them as a wildlife resource through their fishing game agencies. Next slide, please. So um, a big piece of this, as Shana noted, is the ability to uh, take highly animals of high genetics, such as Yellowstone bison, and move them and create these cultural and conservation herds elsewhere for the ecological restoration um, of our American, you know, this is our, our national mammal here. So Yellowstone is a great opportunity for that. And so much so, um, this is back in about 2019, although there was many years leading up to this, is to start um, the, with the ability to um, provide animals, live animals, that go through a, a period of quarantine and brucellosis disease testing to tribes across the plains. 
And so the park has initiated this um, bison conservation transfer program. There was a, an executive um, agreement through the state of Montana under uh, the former Bullock administration and through Fort Peck Indian community um, here in Montana. And then also a, a, a major partner is the Intertribal Buffalo Council. And then on the disease part of it, the USDA Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service um, has disease protocols for testing Yellowstone bison and having them go through a series of tests so that once they do uh, pass uh, all those tests that they can be made available through the tribes in cooperation with the state of Montana. And then two of the NGOs that have been uh, pretty, very active in this program, the Greater Yellowstone Coalition and an organization I work for, Defenders of Wildlife. GYC has uh, provided tremendous funding and donation support in cooperation with Yellowstone Forever to help build up the infrastructure at the, at the testing facilities within Yellowstone. Um, and also just with incredible outreach and advocacy, thanks to Shana Drimmel too. And then Defenders, our role sort of in this pipeline of animals is to, we help pay for the transportation of of animals to the to Fort Peck for final disease testing. And then we have an MOU with Intertribal Buffalo Council also helping to get those animals out to the tribes across the nation. Next slide, please. So this is a little bit of the timeline um, since our, the program's inception. To date, uh, 284 Yellowstone bison have been diverted from slaughter and shipped to Native American, Native nations across the US. That's been our collective goals uh, of the NGOs and tribal partners over the years. As it includes also World Wildlife Fund, National Wildlife Federation, um, Sierra Club, Autobahn. There's a number of us that are involved with making sure that we can advocate for phasing out our, 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 our slaughter operations in the park. We feel like these animals are of such critical importance to overall restoration and to tribes that we should not be killing animals that test negative. We should increase quarantine capacity where we can and get more animals out to the tribes. So for the start, we feel pretty good about the 284, but there's a lot more work to do. And especially if we, if we wanna use that removal tool within the population viability range as an opportunity for tribes to start their herds. Um, so it started in spring of 2019. It was a handful of animals and then we started to ramp up and the big one was fall of 2019 with 55 bulls coming from Yellowstone. And that was quite an amazing celebration on the prairie at Fort Peck. And then uh, over the winters, uh, over that winter and then winters of 2020 and 2021, we had actual families, large families go um, where that is, is so many calves, so many bulls, so many yearlings, so many, um, uh, a diversity of animals that entire families are, are sent, go to Fort Peck, that's the final clearinghouse, and then they're shipped to the tribes. This was uh, Yakima and, and Modoc Nation back in 2021. And then we keep on going. And last year was 112 bison shipped from Yellowstone and, and the USDA facilities. And it's a great partnership. Next slide, please. Some more photos just to give you a little snapshot. So these are the release of the 55 bison bulls at Fort Peck. It was an amazing sight. We have 15 horse trailers line up all together. And Robbie Magnum, the buffalo manager at Fort Peck said, open the doors all together. And we opened them all and the animals came running out onto the prairie and re the, the, you know, reconnected with um, that environment, their, 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 their animals, their, their family members, and the tribes were uh, singing and had dancing, and it was just a great sight. Um, Chairman Azure, uh, Superintendent Sholly, former Superintendent Dan Wink were there and celebrated. And then, of course, they do final post-year disease testing at Fort Peck. They're very much a part of this effort and have invested $800,000 in their facility, but that they'll have one more year at Fort Peck and then they can go to uh, nations across, Native nations across the US. Next slide, please. And I'll, I'll quickly wrap this up. These were the first uh, females to complete quarantine for the transfer program. We load these animals up early in the morning with this really low stress handling, uh, working again with all our partners on the ground. And then we take them in one day 500 miles to Fort Peck. So it's quite the journey uh, that we that this we initiate this uh, pipeline of animals and then ITBC takes it from there with, uh, th with their expertise in trucks and truckers. Next slide, please. Sometimes it's really cold when we release these animals in January, we've had below 30 degree weather and wind and yeah, it's always, it's always interesting. Okay, I think that's that's it for the Bison Conservation Transfer Program. But yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to share this 
information and it's, it's gonna be really important to our comments to make sure we can increase that program and expand it. Back to you, Shana. Sammy, incredible, incredible work there. Okay, so I'm gonna take us back to now, we're gonna talk about the draft EIS uh, proposed alternatives that the park has out currently and are seeking public comment on. Um, so they have provided three proposed alternatives here. Um, and under the first alternative, which is considered sort of the no action alternative, um, the park would continue management of bison pursuant to the existing interagency bison management plan that I talked about earlier. Um, under this, this alternative, the population range would be maintained somewhere between 3,500 and 5,000 bison after calving. And um, the park would rely on slaughter uh, tribal and state hunting and the bison conservation transfer program to manage bison numbers within that range. Um, under alternative two, bison um, would be managed within a population range of about 3,500 to 6,000 animals after calving, with an, really an emphasis on using the bison conservation transfer program to restore bison to tribal lands um, and to support tribal treaty hunting opportunities outside the park uh, to regulate numbers. Um, under this alternative, the park would attempt to reduce the number of bison sent to slaughter. And then under the third alternative, bison would be managed more like how other wildlife are managed today, including elk. Um, the park would stop all slaughter immediately and instead rely on natural selection, bison dispersal, uh, public and tribal harvests in Montana, um, and then still the bison conservation transfer program as the tools to regulate numbers. And um, numbers would likely range between 3,500 and 7,000 or more animals after calving. So, um, we are really recommending sort of a modified alternative that uh, incorporates elements from alternatives two and three with some additional recommendations. Um, overall, we feel like the new plan and final alternative should support bison as a valued migratory wildlife species um, and support their restoration on lands outside the park and beyond on tribal lands. Uh, more specifically, we wanna see the final uh, plan and alternative really commit to moving away entirely from ship to slaughter um, and instead focus on using an improved and expanded tribal and public hunting outside the park, um, as well as the bison conservation transfer program to manage numbers. Um, along that same vein, we really wanna see the plan move away from bison management that has been focused on you know, population reduction, uh, total population targets, um, and or IBMP annual removal objectives, and really instead focus on managing um, and supporting bison dispersal and migration into tolerance areas outside the park, um, supporting tribal treaty rights and access to bison, um, and managing really in response in response to large episodic migrations and real potential for on-ground conflicts. Um, we would like to see a population of at least four uh, to 7,000 bison maintained to support natural migratory behavior um, and dispersal of bison into new areas, both within Yellowstone National Park, but also outside the park within tolerance areas to really expand their ecological role on the larger DYE landscape and to support sufficient tribal access to bison through improved hunting and the transfer program. Um, we want to see the park commit to the continued use and further expansion, as well as improved efficiency of the bison conservation transfer program uh, to support the ecological and cultural restoration of the species to lands outside Yellowstone Park and beyond. Um, we want to see improved tribal engagement, a partnership and cooperation to support treaty rights and access to bison and work and to work closely with tribes really cooperatively to improve the safety and distribution of the hunt happening outside the park. Um, and then lastly, we wanna see this new plan incorporate sort of science-centered adaptive management that really avoids rigid population objectives and allows for the bison population to fluctuate in response to changing environmental and climatic conditions, um, amount and quality of available habitat, uh, improvements in social tolerance and conflict reduction tools, um, and the successful management of bison through non-slaughter population actions, such as improved tribal hunting and the use of the conservation transfer program. So I, I think before we get into questions, um, I'm gonna hand it over to Jason Baldis, who I believe is on the line. 
Um, Jason is from the Eastern Shoshone tribe. He's um, the tribal Buffalo program manager for the National Wildlife Federation. Um, he's on the board of the Intertribal Buffalo Council, and he also started and leads the Wind River Tribal Buffalo Initiative. So he's a little bit busy, and so we super appreciate him joining us today. And I will go ahead and stop sharing the screen, so just give me one second. Thanks, Shana, and thanks, Shami, for uh, the invitation to visit with you today. Um, yeah, several hats around Buffalo Restoration. Um, I'm from the Wind River Indian Reservation here in Wyoming, um, member of the Eastern Shoshone Tribe. <clears throat> and so I also uh, oversee the, the management of, of the Shoshone Tribe's Buffalo and also work closely with the Northern Arapaho, who we share this reservation with. Um, like many tribes, we are very interested in, in the genetics uh, for the conservation um, importance of these Yellowstone animals. Um, we've, we've kind of grown for the last seven years, starting with our first 10 animals in 2016, now up to 90 for the Shoshone tribe and 73 for the Northern Arapaho. This was the first year Shoshone tribe has been able to, to take our own animals from our own lands for our annual Sundance ceremonies. First time in 139 years that that's been possible last year for the Northern Arapaho. So this animal is very important culturally, spiritually, um, but also ecologically, we know that restoration of a keystone species benefits uh, plant and animal biodiversity. And so we're working to actually protect buffalo as, as wildlife under tribal law, which will allow for the expansion of habitat and uh, really follow in the in the history of conservation here on this reservation going back to the 30s with the wilderness area and then the protection of game and in the game code in the 80s wolves and bears in the 90s and and working to protect buffalo uh, for their keystone role but also their cultural importance the intertribal buffalo council is a 30 year old organization that proposed the the quarantine along with other ngo partners back in the 90s uh that trend that uh, quarantine program has been successful in getting animals like to Fort Peck, like uh, was talked about earlier. Intertribal Buffalo Council has restored 25,000 buffalo to 65 herds in 20 states. And so has a real critical role in supporting the member tribes. And this is a government to government relationship. ITBC is a federally chartered organization supporting the sovereign governments of those tribes in which are, are members of ITBC. Um, even though the membership has grown from 20 tribes to over 80 now, the level of funding has stayed stagnant. And so Indian, uh, the uh, Intertribal Buffalo Council has been in DC uh, numerous times to advocate for the federal trust responsibility you know, it was the federal government's effort to eliminate buffalo in the back in the day. Now it's the federal government's trust responsibility to assist tribes in restoration. And that's also land acquisition and things so that we have the habitat. We know reservations have been uh, drastically reduced uh, in those treaties uh, from, from what those treaty agreements were. So tribes have a tremendous role to play. Intertribal Buffalo Council uh, as, as a sovereign organization also uh, supports our member tribes through herd development grants and, and technical assistance. Uh, one one uh, uh, transfer we like to highlight, we, we called it Operation Buffalo, Buffalo Wings, was we actually took three bulls from Yellowstone from the transfer program uh, that, that were at Fort Peck. We, we trucked them to Blackfeet where there was a container built and then they were trucked over to Seattle and put on a plane by FedEx and flown to Anchorage, Alaska. And then those bulls uh, went by barge out to Sitkalitic Island for the Aleutic tribe. So those, those buffalo are now living with, with grizzly bears or brown bears up there uh, in Alaska. So our tribes go from Alaska to New York and cover many, many tribes, uh, many states. Uh, and so very important effort that ITBC has. Um, there's a there's an incredible opportunity really to 
uh, be part of bison conservation. And because of Wind River's proximity to Yellowstone, being in Wyoming, uh, there's there's some really key uh, opportunities for things like co-management and cooperative agreements with off-reservation federal lands and, and playing a role in, in conservation of, of Yellowstone bison. So I appreciate the opportunity. I don't want to take up too much time, but uh, thanks Shana and Shami for the opportunity to, to visit with you all uh, this afternoon and um, look forward to hearing more about the, the conversation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jason, very much for taking the time to talk with us today. And uh, Shami and Shana, thank you so much. Um, I guess one of the things that we really wanted to help emphasize is um, that every comment is important and we would really like everyone who's here to help make a comment and I put the link into the chat. Um, and I, um, so yeah, you can go there. If you have any other questions, uh, feel free to contact us. But um, if you, and then please put questions into the chat now or raise your hand and we'll go through uh, those questions. Um, so Donna Onstott has a question. Um, public hunting is often mentioned as part of this plan. However, unlike for tribal hunting, no further explanation is given. What is the status of public hunting of bison and what is the plan for the future? Shana, do you want to take that? Yeah, so um, the state of Montana issues, I think somewhere around 80 tags every year for state hunters to hunt bison um, in these areas around Yellowstone National Park. Um, I think that public hunting, there isn't a, a large emphasis on public hunting within this EIS, just because that is outside of the scope of this um, planning process. That's really up to, um, you know, Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks. They set the the tags, they they issue the tags and they set the quotas every year. And so um, versus the tribes, you know, the, the park works really closely with the tribes um, and they coordinate around the, the hunt trap, um, basically trapping bison to, um, to ensure that they're not doing it in such a way that, that it impacts the tribal hunt that takes place outside the park. And so, um, and just because of the trust responsibility to tribes, I think that the tribal hunt is just has more emphasis in here. Um, I will say too, that, um, because Montana only issues, you know, 80 or so hunting tags, um, I think the tribal hunt really has more potential to serve as a population management tool um, than the state hunt does. Um, but combined, they, they both um, can serve as a tool. Great. And yeah, um, I think we've talked a lot about a bunch of different issues with bison. So this um, today, so I think I just to remind everybody that the um, draft EIS is for Yellowstone and how Yellowstone will manage their bison, which does help inform everything else. Um, so like including the bison conservation uh, transfer program and things like that. So um, I guess what is the, um, the state of Montana seems to be, um, this seems to want as few bison as possible. Can you explain more about that? Um, Shana or Shami? Um, Jamie, I don't know if you want to dive in or I can, I can take a stab at this. I think that, I mean, that's a great question. And I, I think that a lot of us are sort of asking the, asking the same question, like why is it that the state of Montana um, wants to see a lot fewer of bison and I think, you know, there's many things going on here. I think that a, this has become sort of a political issue. Um, and I don't really want to go down that rabbit hole <laughs> during this conversation, but um, also I think the state, you know, they, they're very much concerned about protecting um, the livestock industry and, um, and, you know, I think for good reason. And, you know, I don't think any of us wants to see uh, the livestock industry um, impacted negatively um, because of wild bison restoration. Um, however, I do believe that this can be done in such a way that it won't have any negative impacts because as I mentioned earlier, you know, our groups worked really hard to, to remove 
the cattle conflicts on the landscape in these areas outside of Yellowstone where bison are allowed to go within the tolerance areas. And um, and we're, we're not asking for an expansion of those tolerance areas at this time. And we just want to see bison using those areas um, more and better distributed. And so um, anyways, it's a, that's a tough question. And, and I wish I knew the answer why. Um, and, I, and I really wish that there was more acceptance and tolerance um, at the state level for, for more bison in our state. But um, at this time, we just don't have it. It appears anyways. <laughs> Jamie, I don't know if you want to add anything, but. <laughs> no, I think that was well said. I think, you know, the state of Montana is on the interagency bison management plan. They're a cooperating partner. So they've been in all the talks and all the meetings relative to the Yellowstone management plan are, and are, are a very key partner and have been over the years. And the Department of Livestock and, and the state vet continue to play a very important role. And it's our hope that we can further those uh, relationships for the betterment of, of our bison resource for Yellowstone and for the cooperating cooperating partners. It, and, and I work all over the plains on bison restoration. And yeah, this conflict is, is, is coexisting with other uses of the land and, and our historic agricultural uses is very real, but we feel like it doesn't have to be one or the other, you know, especially places like Yellowstone where there's science and 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 management of, of, you know, these native animals, it's, uh, it's really important. And so uh, where we can do this and where we can have, you know, solid management and based on science such as Yellowstone and where we can get animals out to the tribes, I, I hope that the, the state can come along and support those efforts in the future. And then Shami and Shana, the EIS, we are we are writing comments to the National Park Service, right? So this is informing them about the bison in the park. These these comments are not going to the state of Montana. I think just we maybe need to make that clear too. Yep. Yeah, I think that's very, that's true, Carrie, and that's important to uh, stress. I think when we are advocating for a population range, it's knowing that those other opportunities for the animals to access the tolerance zones, for the bison conservation program to be expanded, where we can increase quarantine. Um, when those things can be part of the toolbox and we can really have that, that great population range be more fluid and really come into contemporary management and not just be stuck on one number. Right now the numbers, it, it's been 3000 for almost 23 years. It's far too low. We have the biological evidence. We have the, the social support as Shana expressed, you know, minimizing conflicts even outside. And we've got the bison conservation transfer program and more opportunity for co-stewardship with tribes. So it's focused on Yellowstone bison for sure, but it, it I, I would ask people to really consider um, you know, make, this is a long-term plan. So that's why we want these po comments to really support the, the the population increase and not a decreasing population. Jason, I guess you. I was um, thinking about the, the next question uh, about emphasizing an increase in the transfer program. Uh, so I didn't necessarily, I'm not sure if we're ready to go to that one yet or not. Yeah. Um, I, I think we we do want to see an increase in, in the transfer program uh, and getting more animals out to tribes. Um, but we have challenges on tribal lands uh, because much of reservations have been carved up, uh, privatized it, when the, when reservations were open for homesteading. As, as the land managing agency, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, has divided up many reservations into various range units that have priority in cattle production. And some reservations have non-tribal permittees, uh, which makes it very difficult to get some of those lands back or reprioritized for buffalo habitat. And so even though a lot of tribes may want buffalo and want to restore them to the as much of their landscape as they can, we are restricted in that because our lands have been divided up as well. And, you know, the, the treaty, the hunt goes back to treaties. These are promises uh, made by the federal government with tribes 
that have been violated or broken in almost every instance. There were over 800 treaties, 400 of them ratified by Congress, but every single treaty that the federal government made with tribes was broken or violated. And so when it comes to hunting as a treaty right, that's that's something that the tribes are, are are wanting to ensure stays in place. Now there's controversy because the state of Montana is the one who opened up the treaty hunt, and it's not the prerogative of the state of Montana to do that. That is a federal agreement, and so there's challenges to the hunt, and the tribes that are exercising treaty rights there are are very adamant about remaining keeping those rights. Um, I think that expansion to the tolerance zone is the best solution to improving the hunt because it actually allows those animals on uh, grounds where it's not a a slaughter line or a you know a very uh, concentrated area where where animals are being removed. Uh, the Shoshone tribe, we we're not an advocate uh, of the hunt at Beatty Gulch. We are an advocate of being able to exercise our treaty rights but to have an honorable hunt. And that's a different thing that we see happening at Beatty Gulch. And so, you know, that's it's a contentious issue amongst the tribal tribes that have the, the treaty rights to hunt there. Uh, some tribes will work with thinking about the tolerant zone and, and, and maybe holding off on the hunt for a year, but other tribes are, are less so. And so that's a challenge that, that we're working through um, for ITBC. And the other hats that I wear, we want to see more live animals get out of the park. That means that we need to enhance the transfer program and, and see about getting and maximizing the number of live animals that we get out to the out of the park to supplement our tribal herds, you know, work on more land acquisition on our reservations and changing land use priority. Um, but eventually, you know, uh, that is that is the goal. So good question there. So Jason, you started to go into this, and I think this kind of um, also goes to Jesse Logan's question about tolerance zones and increasing tolerance zones. And um, so I don't, I don't know if Jason, if you want to answer this or whoever, um, what are the tolerance zones? So if there's more, what are the tolerance zones currently, and how are we, how can we make sure more bison get there? Yeah, I mean, you may, or Shana, you might want to take that one. To, this is Jesse's question, right? So what about corridors linking Yellowstone bison to other targeted tolerance zones? Yeah, so I mean, as far as the tolerance zones are concerned, um, because Yellowstone bison are diseased, they have the disease brucellosis, um, these, these tolerance areas or these lines have been developed and beyond which bison are basically not allowed to roam. Um, and if they do, then the Department of Livestock will come in and remove those bison, whether that's hazing back in or lethally removing them. Um, and so unfortunately, the fact that they they are diseased really limits our ability to restore them on the kind of larger landscape beyond the tolerance areas currently. Um, and then beyond that, um, we cannot um, transfer or um, allow for restoration of Yellowstone bison anywhere beyond what's called the designated surveillance area, which sort of encompasses the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, unless those bison have been certified as disease free. Um, and that's why we had to develop this quarantine process for them to go through. And so um, at this time until, you know, because they are diseased, uh, there really wouldn't be any way to sort of link up um, corridors between the Yellowstone tolerance areas and any sort of efforts um, beyond the greater Yellowstone ecosystem because of that reason. And how much of the tolerance zones that currently exist are used by bison? Yeah, unfortunately, uh, much of these tolerance areas are really sitting empty, um, especially the west side tolerance area, uh, bison, use very little of that tolerance area. Um, and that's, you know, for a number of reasons. Um, what we do know is that most of the bison that migrate out to the West um, are coming from the central herd 
that herd we know has decreased in size over the last um, you know decade or so. Um, and for whatever reason, bison are starting to change how they migrate within the park. Um, and many of those central herd bison, instead of going west, um, are now going north to access the northern range. And many of them actually now migrate out into the Gardner Basin now every winter. And so there's just not, there's not very many bison um, using the tolerance area outside of West Yellowstone or outside of West and, and at this point. And so um, the other issue is that, you know, there's a large part of the upper Gallatin area on Forest Service lands that's been designated for bison there, year round use actually. Um, but unfortunately, there's not really any decent corridor areas for bison to get there. Um, and so there's been talks in the past about, you know, what do, why don't we consider uh, translocating some Yellowstone bison into like the Taylor Fork area, for example, and sort of trying to start a, a pilot project or a pilot herd there. Um, that was a conversation that was really at the forefront probably five or six years ago. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there was enough um, sort of opposition from some of the private landowners in the Taylor Fork area that have dude ranches um, to that effort. And so that kind of got put on hold and it's not really even being talked about at this point. Um, but because of the highway there um, and because you know, there, there's, you know, the, the other most biologically feasible way for bison to to get into the upper Gallatin would be through the Tom Minor Basin out of the north side. Um, but unfortunately, the Tom Minor Basin is outside of that northern tolerance area. And so bison are not legally allowed to go there. Um, and so a combination of like political boundaries and just not having the right habitat corridors and then highways and other issues and then not very many bison uh, leaving the park on the west side have resulted in like vast areas of these tolerance areas not being used. Now on the north side, it's uh we know why they're not using the full northern tolerance area for the most part, and that's um, because of the congregation of hunting that's taking place right on the park boundary there at BD Gulch. And Jason talked about that. And um, you know, I think you know while we all support treaty hunting, I think that we all can agree that it you know, there's a lot of work that needs to be done there to sort of um, spread that hunt out on their larger landscape and, and allow some of those bison to move through that area and access the full extent of the northern tolerance area. Um, if that's mm -hmm. hopefully that answers everyone's question there. Yeah. And, and maybe if I could just add, Jonathan, sure. please, um, Shana, that was well said. The, the thing that the NGOs have long been advocating for is that this has to stem from the interagency bison management plan, this larger landscape, there's been a lot of emphasis on better utilization of the habitats outside the park, particularly the West Tolerance area, but we just haven't been able to see the animals get over there. But the Custer Gallatin now has a plan that they revised that allows for the animals to utilize that habitat and for them to manage restoration projects to encourage that migration to, uh, to happen. So. We're, we remain hopeful that maybe some of these political and biological and 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 some of the, the the hunting barriers that are are compounding this issue can be they're not insurmountable to the Yellowstone plan and to managing for um, a range of populations so that when we're once we're able to get these pieces together uh, in the future that this can be more more animals on a larger landscape but it's complicated as you can tell um, anyway I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Great, yeah, thank you. Um, so there's a couple questions about um, treaties in the chat. I don't know if anyone wants to answer those. Um, if you take a I'll look. take a step, Jonathan. <clears throat> um, a lot of the tribes that are, are participating in the, the treaty hunt are tribes that were part of the Stevenson treaties. <clears throat> that that was uh, many of the tribes in in Montana, Idaho, Washington, and Oregon, and these tribes are somewhat uh, the the language in the Stevenson treaties is such that um, it it distinguishes some right to Yellowstone, and there's people that will argue some of the language. You know, the treaties were written in a different lingo than we use in, in law or, or agreements today. So they're vague. And, uh, but, but at the same time, you know, those treaties uh, supersede statehood, they supersede 
um, any of the the other agreements that came in in place that even established Yellowstone. So these treaties are the oldest agreements in place. Uh, and even though they've been broken and violated, many tribes are are exercising those rights. There's some federal Indian law uh, precedent that is supporting the the rights of tribes. Um, so the Fort Laramie, uh, the, the Stevenson Treaty, treaties, they have different language. Um, but there is some tribes like the Northern Arapaho who we share a reservation with who are exercising a treaty right that is based in that 1855 Fort Laramie Treaty. Uh, and even though they're not members of, of the, the treaty that the Shoshone tribe signed, they're exercising those rights. And so it kind of varies on the tribe. It, it kind of it varies in the language of the treaty. And, and I, I know I'm not probably answering that question very well, but um, it, it has to do with the language. And, and that's kind of getting to, to Patrice and Robert's uh, questions there. Um, Sarah's question there about uh, treaties are dictating what is, uh, do not dictate what is allowed, but rather what is not allowed. Um, I'm not sure where, where to go with that one, other than, you know, the, the language in those treaties is, is vague compared to how we would maybe write those today. But uh, we think about uh, some precedent that has been set with Supreme Court decisions like the Herrera case or the McGirt case in Oklahoma, uh, which is also contentious, but the Supreme Court has recognized tribes have rights to off reservation hunting on federal lands. Some federal parks uh, have been, you know, doing their due diligence to to kind of meet the meet that request uh, without having to litigate, um, but. You know, the, there's there's efforts by states to undermine tribal sovereignty. Tribes are very weary of that because, again, our treaties supersede statehood. Uh, that Herrera case has to do with subsistence hunting and being able to hunt off reservation. Uh, there's, you know, for, for us at Wind River on this reservation, we've we've successfully managed wildlife such that we have the best hunting uh, in the state, and so it doesn't always makes sense for us to have to leave the reservation to hunt. Um, and so, you know, some tribes have the capability to subsistence uh, hunt and feed their families from, from animals and populations of wildlife on our own lands, but many tribes do not. And so, you know, you think of Crow and Northern Cheyenne and some of the other reservations in Montana that are, that are working to exercise their off-reservation treaty hunting rights, not only with buffalo, but other species as well. And, and so um, that, that last point about, <clears throat> about the reserve rights doctrine in, in terms with tribal bison hunting, I, I would ref, really have to look into that one to answer that uh, reasonably. So um, sorry, sorry if that was vague, but that's kind of my attempt at that one. Thanks, Jason. Appreciate you taking, yeah, answering those. Um, I... Oh, so we have another question from John Heidke. Quarantine and transfer um, seem a noble idea. The number of animals is, seems small. What's the cost? Who bears that cost? And I'll add, how do we get to higher, higher numbers of transfer? Yeah, it um, has a lot to do with, John, it's an excellent question the designated surveillance area and where where the park and where USDA can actually have these quarantine facilities. We have two and we can accommodate approximately 240 animals in them and they're all on different clocks in terms of the, the disease testing and the protocols and, and the cows have to have at least one calf while in quarantine. So there's a lot of rules under the USDA APHIS uh, protocols that apply to the disease portion of it. We realize disease management is a reality for getting Yellowstone animals alive and out to tribes, but we think it's an important, um, it's, it's, it's important to do this because of the genetics and because these animals are so wide. I mean, they have bigger heads. They, they migrate differently than they, they have 
they're in the rut, they act differently and, and they're really able to, you know, act as wildlife when they get onto tribal lands and be managed that way. So even though our efforts might seem fruitful in the in the very beginning of this program, we hope to increase capacity. We um, are looking at options on what that could look like, um, maybe shorting the clock, like not having to test bison bulls. Uh, and that looks like that's going to be a, a USDA APHIS consideration next year that would allow more animals into quarantine. Um, so a, a lot of work remains on that front. ITBC also has agreements with other parks where they can utilize bison from Badlands or Theodore Roosevelt and diversify herds. So it's not just Yellowstone genetics, but bringing in animals from other herds. Um, but we do hope that Yellowstone pipeline can increase the cost. In terms of the cost, it's a shared cost. Largely Yellowstone, USDA, APHIS uh, pay for those facilities. GYC has been able to ra raise tremendous dollars for infrastructure development. Defenders helps pay for the trucks and truckers. We usually use Blackfeet members. And then there's also a big effort on the tribal lands to help with the costs associated with managing those Buffalo programs as we partner with the tribes on the ground and ITBC. But we we need we'd like to increase capacity and the future is is uh, looking pretty good for that. It's just going to take more time and more cooperation among the the political partners. Yeah, thank you, Shami, and yeah, um, we're yeah ex glad for your work and um, yeah, hopefully we can increase the number transferred. Um, so if people want to make comments and um, especially comments about increasing the bison conservation transfer program. What is the best way to do that, Shana? I would, you can, you can provide comments around that. I think within this EIS, I think that's, that's definitely appropriate here. Um, we certainly are, um, you know, alternative two is really, that's that's one reason why we want to pull some of that emphasis that's within alternative two and the focus on really growing that program and working with the tribes to kind of culturally and ecologically restore bison. Um, so yeah, I would definitely comment um, on this EIS there. Um, but going forward, there's going to continue to be opportunities, I think, as each of our conservation orgs and, and all the work that Jason is doing and the different um, agencies there's going to be other opportunities going forward, no doubt, um, to weigh in on further expansion of the Bison Conservation Transfer Program. And so I would just suggest that people, um, you know, get on our, you know, each of our like mailing lists and just sort of stay tuned and stay in touch. And we'll let you know when those opportunities arise. Great. Yeah. And we're, um, we try to keep these to an hour. So, I mean, thank you for everyone for taking the time to come um thank you especially to shana shammy and jason for taking time to speak with us um is there anything else anyone would like to add uh, sarah asked aside from commenting on the plan what are other ways we can support um the speaker's amazing work around bison i don't know if anyone has any last words they'd like to offer No, I think you're doing it. And thanks to PCEC. Um, this is this is a great effort. This is our national mammal. And yeah, commenting on the plan and staying engaged and being advocates. That's what it takes. Just public resources and it takes the public. So thank you all so much. This is a great opportunity to engage. Thanks, Shami and Shana and Jonathan for organizing the call. Appreciate the invitation to visit. I did leave the uh, drop the windriverbuffalo.org website in if you'd like to learn more about the efforts here at Wind River for the Shoshone and Arapaho tribes, uh, take a look at that. So thanks again, everybody, and for the great questions that everybody provided. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. And yeah, we'll um, post this on YouTube and um, send it out an email to everybody with information on how to comment. So thank you um, very much, everybody. Have a good day.